Welcome to my series on practical transfusion medicine. I am Kathleen Wong and I am a hematopathologist at the University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. This is part 3, Informed Consent and Transfusion Adverse Events. By the end of this session, you'll be able to achieve the following objectives. Number 1. Describe the required components in an informed consent discussion for transfusion in non-emergent settings. Number 2. Outline the common, serious, theoretical and unknown risks associated with transfusion. Number 3. Describe the general approach and immediate actions to take in a suspected transfusion reaction. Number 4. Outline the differential diagnosis and management of fever occurring in association with a transfusion. And number 5. Outline the differential diagnosis and management of shortness of breath occurring in association with a transfusion. So let's first begin with informed consent. The administration of blood components and plasma protein products is governed by the standards and recommendations published by the Canadian Society of Transfusion Medicine, the Canadian Standards Association, the College of American Pathologists, and the AABB. Legislation in Alberta's Adult Guardian and Trusteeship Act, AGTA, provides decision-making options for healthcare providers, physicians, patients and their families to use to ensure that consent for healthcare is obtained from the appropriate decision makers. For more information, please visit the Office of the Public Guardian. The AGTA is administered by the Office of the Public Guardian. Informed consent is a process consisting of a discussion between the patient and the most responsible healthcare provider prior to a transfusion being administered to a patient. The conversation includes discussing the indications and benefits and risks of transfusion, the risks of not having a transfusion, and alternatives to transfusion. The conversation must allow the patient to ask any questions about the procedure, risks, and alternatives. This conversation must be documented on the consent form, and it is available on the internal Alberta Health Services intranet website called Insight. Risks that should be discussed include the most common adverse events and transfusion reactions, to the most serious and potentially life-threatening adverse events and reactions, including the infectious risks, and finally, the theoretical and unknown risks of transfusion. Common adverse events would include discomfort during IV catheter insertion or blood collection for testing, and bruising at the IV site afterwards, etc. Common transfusion reactions would include allergic reaction and febrile reaction, while examples of the most serious and potentially life-threatening adverse events and reactions include the risks of transmissible diseases and ABO-incompatible transfusions, etc. The risks associated with the transfusion itself include allergic and febrile reactions, shortness of breath related to volume overload and trolley, and hemolytic reactions. The discussion should therefore include common risks of little consequence, patient-specific risks, and the rare but potentially life-threatening risks. Common risks of little consequence are fever, urticaria, and pain at the IV site. Fever is more frequent in platelet transfusions versus red cell transfusions. Urticaria or mild allergic reactions occur in about 1 in 100. The rare but serious hazards of transfusion are acute hemolysis, anaphylaxis, bacterial sepsis, and transfusion-related acute lung injury, known as trolley. The risks of these rare but serious events are noted on the slide. It is important to note that the risk of acute hemolytic transfusion reactions and cases of fatal acute hemolysis are not zero, despite the robust processes and protocols in place for proper patient identification during specimen collection for testing and at the time of transfusion. The risks of symptomatic and fatal bacterial sepsis are higher for platelets versus red cells, and the estimated risk of trolley is well under 1%, but the mortality rate is approximately 50%. Here are some patient-specific risks to consider. Remember that fluid overload is more likely to occur in the elderly, cardiac, and renal failure patients. Patients with red cell auto or allo antibodies are at higher risk for hemolytic reactions. And finally, chronically transfused patients would be at risk for iron overload. This slide outlines the estimated risks of transfusion-transmitted hepatitis B, HTLV, hepatitis C, HIV, and West Nile virus. This data is referenced from Bloody Easy 4. As you can see, the risks of transmission transmitted viral infections are extremely low, but again are not zero. Finally, despite rigorous testing and research, there are still unknown risks associated from blood transfusion due to infectious agents that remain to be discovered and identified 
and known diseases that cannot be screened, for example, variant CJD. Now let's discuss transfusion adverse events and reactions. The first step in approaching a suspected transfusion reaction is to stop the transfusion and then to maintain the IV site by running a normal saline solution. Pre and post transfusion vital signs, i.e., temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation should be obtained and compared. Further, a clerical check at the bedside is done to determine whether the correct product was transfused to the correct patient. This means comparing the information on the product tag against the patient's identifying information on their ID bands and blood bank identification number, known as the BBIN. The remaining product bag and all IV tubing should then be returned to the blood bank and the back of the product tag should be completed to indicate the pre- and post-transfusion vital signs and all symptoms and signs associated with the reaction. Next, the patient location orders a transfusion reaction investigation on the blood bank requisition form. When the post-transfusion specimen arrives in blood bank, it is centrifuged and examined for gross evidence of hemolysis. Then the technologist performs a post-transfusion direct anticoagulant test. Next, the transfusion medicine physician is called regarding the possibility of a transfusion reaction. Now let's discuss the approach and management of fever and shortness of breath in association with transfusion. Fever occurring in association with the transfusion may be unrelated to the transfusion. If it is related to the transfusion, then it is most commonly a febrile, non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, but other considerations would include bacterial sepsis and acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. A febrile, non-hemolytic reaction is attributed to cytokines in the blood component transfused or the patient's own HLA antibodies reacting to the residual leukocytes in the blood component. In a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, the temperature rises at least 1 degree Celsius and is above 38 degrees Celsius during or up to 4 hours post-transfusion. Additional symptoms may include chills and rigors. Please note a fever may not be present if the patient has recently received acetaminophen. The post-transfusion DAT is negative in a febrile non-hemolytic reaction. The general management steps were discussed previously and include stopping the transfusion maintaining the IV line with normal saline, comparing the pre- and post-transfusion vital signs, and performing a clerical check of the product tag and the patient's ID and BBIN. When assessing the patient, the physician must determine whether signs and symptoms are suspicious for bacterial sepsis or acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. If not, acetaminophen may be administered and the transfusion restarted cautiously under close observation. Stop the transfusion if the patient develops severe fever above 39 degrees Celsius, hypotension or shock, or other symptoms as outlined on the slide. If signs and symptoms are suspicious for bacterial sepsis or acute hemolysis, then do not restart the transfusion and consult the transfusion medicine physician on call immediately to guide further management and investigation. Shortness of breath occurring in association with the transfusion may be unrelated to the transfusion. If it is related to the transfusion, the differential diagnosis includes transfusion-associated circulatory overload, TACO, and acute lung injury, TRALI, but other possible etiologies include bacterial sepsis, severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, and acute hemolysis. The acute lung injury must be acute in onset, and there must be hypoxemia on arterial blood gas or oxygen saturation below 90% on room air or other clinical evidence such as cyanosis. Bilateral lung infiltrates are identified on the chest X-ray, and the patient does not have evidence of circulatory overload. The definition of trolley requires that the new onset acute lung injury occur during or within six hours of completion of transfusion, and that the patient has no other risk factors for direct or indirect lung injury as outlined on the slide. In addition to the general management steps that were previously discussed, for shortness of breath that occurs during or post-transfusion, baseline documentation and testing must also include comparison of the pre- and post-transfusion respiratory rates and oxygen saturations, requesting a chest X-ray and or arterial blood gas, and of course, physician assessment of the patient. Depending on the clinical circumstances, diuretics may be helpful, and additional investigations including blood cultures and hemolytic markers may also be considered. In summary, Informed consent is a process and comprises a discussion between the patient and the most responsible healthcare provider prior to administering a non-emergent transfusion.
The discussion explains the indications, benefits, and risks of transfusion, the risks of not transfusing, and alternative treatments to transfusion. The three risk categories to be discussed are the common adverse events and transfusion reactions, serious and potentially life-threatening risks, and the theoretical and unknown risks. Careful clinical and laboratory assessment is critical when you suspect a transfusion adverse event or reaction. In the Edmonton zone in Alberta, there is a transfusion medicine physician on call 24/7, so please call the TM physician right away if the patient develops respiratory distress or hemodynamic instability in association with a transfusion. And finally, remember the only way to prevent a transfusion adverse event or reaction is not to transfuse at all. So consider alternatives to blood products when it is clinically appropriate. Here is the website address for the Alberta Health Services Transfusion Medicine homepage, where you can find further information on blood components and products, informed consent to transfusion, transfusion medicine forms, and transfusion reactions. Finally, other useful resources are Bloody Easy 4, a guide to transfusion medicine. It is available as a free PDF download at transfusionontario.org. The Canadian Blood Services Clinical Guide to Transfusion is available at the website shown. And the National Advisory Committee on Blood and Blood Products Guidelines and Recommendations are available at nacblood.ca. This concludes Part 3, Informed Consent and Transfusion Adverse Events. Thank you very much for your attention.